attending on such a, a warm evening. Um, so as I say, thank you very much for doing that. Um, I hope I can give you a little bit of insight into um, 10 steps to uh, a leak free system. So what we're going to do is sort of discuss the problem, which is um, within a system, there's often too many connections. You're working in a harsh environment. Um, you're limited by the workmanship of the person who put the system together. Um, you've got H2S, uh, salt, corrosion issues. You've got the logistics if you're if you're a site uh, maintenance engineer um, of too many components to deal with. Availability, pressure, temperature, all those sorts of things all add to the problem of leaks on a system. So we're going to go through each of them and have a little bit of a discussion. Um, as David said, any questions, please put your hand up at the end or put them in the comments box and we'll answer them all at the end. So the one step one is to is all related to MPT. Um, the main issue with MPT is it's very subjective. So um, you know what you can't do with an MPT thread is talk it up to a certain torque value or how many turns is it that will make that um, connection secure and leak free. Um, the issue there is that then you are limited to the workmanship of the person putting the system together. And this is all fine and really uh, good if you've got someone who does this day in, day out, every day, and who's been fully and properly trained. However, as we know, particularly for new builds, etc., these are may often made in uh, high value centers and maybe the training is not as good as we'd we'd hope. So what we're trying to do is reduce the number of leak paths, get rid of PTFE tape. We're finding uh, more and more clients are stating that PTFE tape should not be used. Um, they therefore say using some sort of um, glue, some sort of Loctite. The only challenge with Loctite um, is that you have to, um, you know, if you get it wrong, then you have to try and clean all the Loctite off before re, you know, putting some further Loctite on again to redo the connection. Um, and that's only good if you're doing it straight away, obviously. If you've put that system together, left it for the 24 hours that you need to before testing, and then you find there's a leak, then you've actually got a real problem then. Um, trying to take the system apart again. Um, also, that, that sort of thing also gives you some sealing contamination and sealant contamination. Um, you also have the issues of galling, particularly if you're uh, trying to replace or, or put separate pieces to apart and then put them back together again. So what you'll see on, on the picture is um, this would be your traditional setup, traditional method, which is two fittings attached to a, a valve, be that a needle valve or ball valve. And then what we've got at the top is what, what we call integral ended fittings. So these, this is basically a single piece unit for which the threads have been um, ground out of, of there, um, machined out, and then your fitting, your twin ferrule fitting forms part of the valve. There is no actual um, customer made connection there for the, the valve itself. Therefore, all you need to do is do the um, connection of the tube to the valve. It does reduce the amount of skill required by the fitter. Um, so what we've got is, as I say, removing that Teflon tape. Um, you can see in the bottom here um, a traditional setup with a lot of PTFE tape used. And what are, what we can do for, for example, for manifolds is we have uh, the PT free manifold. This is um, a fitting which has been um, parallel threaded and pinned in place. So it's an integral part, an integrally tested part, pressure tested part of the system. Um, and what you can do with that then is ensure that again, you, you aren't using MPT connections, you're fitting 
um, your tube will go straight into that uh, fitting. You can connect up. Um, there's also other options you can see sort of in the picture down at this side where it's almost reversed. Um, so the fitting uh, nut is attached to the manifold and the 90 degree elbow is then held in place and screwed in reverse onto the 90 degree bend. If anybody's ever tried um, to install a 90 degree bend into a manifold and you want it facing like downwards, the chances of you being able to get that, you know, turn it enough times in order that you actually have the uh, fitting, you know, the, the, the 90 degree bend facing down is very, very unusual. So normally what you've got two options then. Well, there's three options. One, you can take it out and start again. But normally what happens is either the person will loosen it off a little bit to get it to, to the, the 90 degrees down, or more often than not, we'll actually get a nice big spanner and a bit of a leverage and a few muscles and actually turn it further to get that at the 90 degree downwards. Well, what you're doing there is, is you're putting additional stress into the manifold and that can when you get that additional additional stress plus the um, industry that we're working in with oil and gas with um, H2S or salt you have um, increased your potential for stress corrosion cracking of that manifold um, now, people say, well, that's a big block of metal. It'll be fine. It, it won't have any of those issues. We've had um, been reported with respect to a number of incidents where due to incorrect installation or um, over tightening, um, we've been advised that the actual manifold, the whole manifold block has actually cracked. And there's been actually a crack in the manifold block. Um, stress corrosion cracking does not differentiate between sort of a thin or a thick piece of metal. Once you've actually got that stress corrosion crack permeating, it, it can quite quickly go. And obviously, the situation we've got here is that we're looking at um, uh, containment of quite hazardous product and often at, at quite you know, high pressures as well. So, you know, safety is always our key thing within the oil and gas industry, chemical industry. And release of high pressure uh, product is really a, a no no. And we've had, we've been reported of incidents where, you know, things have um, flown out of, of units where, as I say, extra stress has been put on there or it's not been put in there correctly. So it's always a concern. Safety is our number one concern always. So flange connectors um, is another way of interfacing from your from your uh, process connection, be it be it a flange to tubing. And again, normally what you will have is you'll have your flange with an MPT thread in there, and then you will screw in a fitting. Again, that's a key point for leak. It's a key point for stress corrosion as well. Um, the other thing is, if you get it as one unit, then obviously it's fewer components, um, less room for error, no galling, less parts, quicker to install. You're not putting two units together. Um, and one of the things you are avoiding, of course, is also mixing material. Um, if it's one unit, then you're not going to be having any uh, an issue with mixing of materials there. Um, if anybody wants to sort of, I have, I'm just going to come up. Um, I did want to position this right. So this is actually a, a flange with um, the fitting attached. And if I just take this off, what you've got is the twin ferrule fitting within the unit. And all you're doing is you would fit this flange onto the process connection, put your tube into there and then tighten down onto the tube doing your one and a quarter turns. Makes 
connections much more simpler and easier for your installers and a lot quicker. And if there is an, an ever a problem, um, maybe at the, at the fitting or the tube uh, corrosion, then you can actually just replace this bit. You're not having to pull the whole process apart to do so. So the uh, next thing that we can you can look at with respect to ensuring that you are uh, eliminating leaks is to eliminate again an MPT thread. So rather than having where you've got a gauge and normally your gauge would come with an NPT threaded end, you would buy a gauge with a tube ended gauge and you would get a uh, a mono flange. This is a nice. Uh, demonstration see through one which engineers love to see and, and pass around because you can actually see I don't know if you can see that you can actually see the um, flow paths running through the the unit um, and then of course we have an OS and Y valve at the top so that covers our piping people's requirements for isolation and then we've got a um, the other, so this is a double block and bleed valve, and we've got the initial block, the initial block, and the bleed here. Now this has um, a special connection, which means that it can, it's what we call our anti-tamper. So unless you've got the special um, key that goes in here, then you can't actually vent the system. Um, the good thing with this is, as I say, you can't vent it, though I have seen on occasion people hanging the key that goes with this actually from the unit. Um, not doesn't really sort of stop them people actually tampering with it if they if the keys actually hanging off the end. But, um, you know, the whole po point would be not to have this lying around so that there would be no potential for um, an engineer to vent that system without actually having the right permits uh, and the the anti tamper key which would go with that permit um, and what you can see obviously on this unit we haven't got the um, NPT uh, the integral fitting technology attached um, but what you can see is on this unit on the drawing you will see here this is actually the fitting so again, it's a whole single unit which would be connected to your process line and on the other side, you're going straight into tubing. So this is, you know, you're not looking at having multiple ball valves um, that you're having to connect together. This is all a single unit. Now, obviously, as you saw with the um, flow paths, um, this unit would predominantly be used for gases. Um, that's basically because if you you know put a heavy heavy crude or something through that those um, fine flow paths would very quickly become um, blocked but for for light uh, products or gases then you've got you've got your uh, straight into your gauge and one of the things I mean depending on where, which industry or what region you're working in obviously this works exceptionally well where you're trying to um, remove or reduce weight and size. Um, as you saw from, from the unit I held up, this is a much more compact unit to uh, anything you would have um, with multiple ball valves. And obviously the weight is much reduced as well. So if you want to do the similar thing with respect to um, the um, a more heavier product then obviously what you need to do is reg again reducing the leak paths again a double block and bleed valve but this would have either a gauge or a transmitter connected to it um, with a um, some other sort of flange so it could be a flange to flange rather than a flange to fitting um, but what you're looking, trying to do here again is reduce the number of leak paths. Again, you've got a double block and bleed valve here. The traditional way of putting multiple valves together really um, 
what you're trying to do is remove that every connection you make is a potential leak path and the more than if you limit the number of connections you straight away limit the number of leak paths um this one as i say is is ball valve um and that's ideal when you've got a slightly highly higher thicker media sorry i'm trying to uh position this so you can actually see but this is how as a a through bore ball valve system and again can have the it comes with with our version it comes with an empty tamper but again you've got that directly connected to your process line and then the top end is an is integral fitting so again you're looking at reducing leak paths this is you know the whole point of of the presentation and the whole point of of using this is removing those potentials for leak um, and by consolidating units together and making simpler default signs. Um, the other area that you need to be thinking about is obviously support. Um, leaks often occur in systems that haven't been supported. Um, if you've got a traditional multi-ball, excuse me, <coughs> um, a multi-ball valve system, then you are, in most cases, you're going to have to provide some sort of additional support um, to hold the weight of, of that multi-ball valve system. So again, if that's not done correctly, you can actually start putting uh, strain on connections and therefore um, you will get leaks, particularly in situations where you've got vibration. Um, that might be vibration um, because of pulsing down the line. Um, uh, if it's a high pressure drop, um, you know, those sorts of things can cause that, you know, that in, in vibration within the system. Um, and again, if you've got connections that are slightly unstable, then you are going to have potential for, for uh, damage. And again, it can you can you know damage can occur quite quickly um through the stress of, of vibration so again i you know if you have one of these these units again you know all always when you're design if you're designing and you have a design of this it's always better to try and have this sort of fitted vertically rather than horizontally particularly if you're not going to support it and you're not going to um if you've got a high vibration system um you know the the chances on a high vibration system when if this is jiggle, you know wiggling and jiggling day on day out for, for days on end you know there could be potential stress again so one of the things we always recommend is have a look at the design you know are you uh, designing in problems or are you actually looking at designing out problems um, and uh, Parker and and others are more than happy to discuss you know your designs and review designs um, I mean because I work in projects a lot I, I often find that you know by the time we get involved in design the design sort of way past the point at which we can make any changes and you know, we always look at that and sort of say, you know, if you'd have only spoken to us early on in your process, we could have talked to you about some advantages, some designs that would have provided a better solution. Um, you know, we we work in this industry, in this instrumentation, tube and fittings, you know, valve industry, day in, day out. If If we've seen it happen, if there's a chance of us seeing it happen, we've probably seen it happen. Um, so yeah, we we can we can always give you some advice, and then it's you know it's free advice, and it's it's something we're happy to give um, because it's it's in our advantage to to improve the the overall design within the industry. So these are just some examples. So this was the old um, old design. Uh, with multiple, you know, multiple normal valves and a, and a manifold block, and then a screwed connection uh, with a swivel gauge on there. 
um, and this is the new improved design. Though this one actually hasn't got, this has still got a swivel gauge on with an MPT thread here. What would have been better would have been to have integral fitting technology and have that tube ender gauge. Again, you know, if you're installing a, a gauge and you install it on an MPT connection, unless you have a swivel adapter, the chances are as you turn this to install it, SOD's law will say it's facing the wrong way when you're finished doing the turns. You know, whereas if you have a tube ender gauge, you can just put that tube straight into the fit into the fitting and tighten the fitting onto the tube exactly where you need that gauge. So it's facing in the right direction the whole time. Again, those it's those little things that sort of, you know, can can really cause, you know, an annoyance on the site and an annoyance for the for the client or, or yourselves. So the first uh, one of the key areas, obviously, for um, ensuring that there is no um, emissions or leak is where you have um, uh, fugitive emissions. So this is where we're talking about predominantly H2S. Um, and I appreciate with them, you know, I, I don't know where you're from and the markets you're working in, but obviously we don't have a great deal of H2S in, in our in our sort of North Sea region. But as soon as you start going into the Middle East and into the Caspian regions, then H2S becomes a, a critical issue. And so one of the things you need to make sure is that you're working with a supplier who is fully aware of those, um, the certification requirements. So the ISO uh, class A certification requirement, H2S compliant. And you can see on this um, example, some further examples where we've got flange to fitting or flange to flange applica applications ball valve, needle valve versions, et cetera, et cetera. But it's all trying to make sure that you're looking at the the compliance that you need. Now, obviously, what you don't need to do is put a H2S compliant fugitive emissions valve on a, let's say, a, a water system. It, it's, it's overkill. So again, it's making sure that you're not over designing either. Um, you know, we always, we, we often sort of, get a, a customer saying well we you know we'd we'd we want this and we want that and then we give them the price and they're like oh well that's a little bit too expensive and then we look at it and we sort of say well what are you doing with this and then you know when you get down to the nitty-gritty of the design you're like well you've over designed this you've over specified it um you know where you need to have that high specification absolutely go for it where you don't need those really high specifications then look at your specif specs and see whether or not they're oh you know over specified um and whether or not there's there are things there that can be removed without removing any safety safety issues obviously safety is absolutely critical but there are things you know there may be things in that specification that are adding um, cost. So it may be that the material is overspecified. So you go for super duplex when you could go for a 6MO or stainless steel for the application. Um, you could be making the flange larger when actually a smaller flange would do the job. Or you're putting three or four ball valves in a system when you could have one integral system, you know, integral system, you know, rather than having three double block and bleed valve or you know, double block and bleed. Um, so, you know, I mean, what we say here is close couple solutions. Um, here we're looking at uh, trying to bring the um, measurement device closer to the process line. Now, the whole point of doing instrumentation a measurement is to get an accurate measurement. The further away you take the measuring device away from the process line, the more likelihood that you're going to add leaks, but also the more likelihood that the measurement is going to be affected by the, the surroundings. Um, say, for example, on a day like today, 
then if you have a whole route of, of instrumentation tube and fittings from your process line to your gauge or transmitter, then on a sunny day like today, you know, this being metal, it's going to warm up. The product's going to warm up. Well, what happens to product once it warms up? It expands. Therefore, you know, and it will raise in temperature. So if what, what you're trying to do is measure its temperature, obviously the temperature is going to, to change. So again, you know, bringing the transmitter or the gauge closer to the process line gives you a much better and more robust, simpler and more accurate system. So again, you're removing components, you're removing potential for leak. So here we have um, just some examples of where we've made systems simpler. Um, we've got on here the actual, this customer that we made this for didn't even want a, a, a initial process in isolation valve. He said, I'm more than happy just to have your um, pipe, you know, OSMY, so a piping approved uh, valves on the system. And I'm just going to put a flange on there with um, a integral fitting and therefore and my gauge will connect, connect straight to that. I say apologies, these are a little bit small. I'm hoping you can see them um, on the design. And here, you know, this was um, a rather than a large ball valve here. What we've got is it's called a mono ball. So actually in this in this is basically almost like a flange. But actually, part of that flange is a ball valve. So it's it's straight, you know, it's a flat plate. It's piping approved, but it is there and it's a it's just a it almost looks like a plate rather than a very large ball valve. Um, again, you're reducing weight, you're reducing stress. The one you can see here actually has um, stud um, integral studs. So you can slide that straight onto the um, process connection, bolt up, slide this, the mono flange that we looked at here, uh, the, um, the mono flange here, slide that straight on, bolt that on. And then the transmitter in this case, because it's, it's a flange transmitter, the transmitter would bolt again straight onto that. And that's your whole system. You know, you've got, you've got one, two, three, points of potential leak of which you're bolting these through uh, with gaskets etc so consequently the potential for um, leakage is greatly reduced and that's what we're trying to do and then you know as a consequence you get a much better and more accurate measurement as well you can actually go to sort of I would say extremes with the close coupling. Um, so this is um, a system designed for flow measurement. So here what we've got is we've got um, the process pipeline running down here. We've got some tapped flanges as part of that system. And we've got two lines going. So this is a differential pressure transmitter to give us flow. We have running up this side the primary isolation valve and then the manifold with the double block and bleed and then again on this side the primary isolation and a double block and bleed on this side. <coughs> We've also got a, a green one here in order to do a, a uh, pressure connection measurement to actually um, do the calibration of the gauge as well. And this all works, uh, is all connected together, it's self-supporting so then it requires no supports on the pipeline. And the simple thing, and I would have shown you this if I'd have actually got, uh, we'd have been all together. Um, but this actually, once you close the ball valves here, it actually releases a pin and you can use a special tool just to remove this top half section very quickly. Um, it's been developed and was used extensively in um, cold climates because it requires very little um, 
heated heating um, on the system because also the pipeline and, and the system are all very close together. So, you know, we didn't need a huge amount of trace heating on this, but also the um, uh, the client was worried about the amount of time taken being outside um, in, uh, you know, in the atmosphere for the for the workers um, in changing the systems over. And so they wanted something that could be changed over very, very quickly. So other than the electrical connection to the transmitter and nowadays with wireless you still need a little bit of power but with wireless um etc you know you've got you've got a few wires to disconnect and a 30 second you know a 30 second changeover on this unit um you know the, the important thing here is is all is as i say the speed the reduce of reducing the gauge error etc by keeping everything to get close together. So this is sort of, we call it again, close coupling. And you can see this in the gray is almost the traditional way of doing things where you'd have a flange with an MPT thread with a uh, fitting on there, screwed into the MPT thread, a bit of tubing, and then a couple of fittings screwed into uh, a, a isolation valve here, another screwed fitting, and then another screwed fitting between the gauge and the tubing. Whereas that is all replaced by this single unit. No support, you're removing your MPTs, you're reducing leak path, you've got a simple design, it's lighter, it's faster to assemble, faster to install. I mean, we have some key uh, clients um, included, you know, key companies like BP, etc., who are looking at things like this and buy them because they are so much quicker and simpler to install. And they find that they've got... Um, sorry, could someone mute because I'm getting feedback over here. I hope you're not. Um, the situation there is then that you've got a much simpler design. It's faster to assemble, faster, and it removes that accidental disassembly, you know, where somebody sort of turns something off and then realizes and, and starts removing parts without realizing they've, they're still uh, fluid in the process and they haven't done the system correct. And it also removes the issues associated with inexperienced installers um, with someone who isn't experienced with tube and fittings. Most people can put bolts together or bolt systems together. It, it's not, you know, the, the, the amount of experience required to do that. And we've we've done systems where, you know, we've done on a new build 80 percent um, reduction in MPT, 80% reduction in time taken to install. So a traditional system, um, which this would be a very simple one, um, you know, may may take, you know, with all the cutting of the tube and the bending of the tube, etc. you may be looking at, you know, a good few hours to put that all together. And that would be using an experienced uh, fitter. Whereas, I mean, it's obvious this would, you know, you can actually have this supplied with the transmitter in place, all all put together, all calibrated, and you've got four bolts to put together. Um, you know, with a little torque wrench, you're probably put, you're looking at sort of 10, 15 minutes if at that to put that whole thing together and get it up and running. Um, and, you know, it's fully tested. So, you know, the amount of time doing a leak test or a, a pressure test, again, will be reduced and removed. So these are some examples, sort of an onshore and offshore application with these units being installed. So you can see they're very much more compact. And that, again, what you're looking for is that compactness. Um, again, I'm not sure which industries or which areas you're working in, but obviously offshore weight and uh, space is is at a premium. So again, what you want to be thinking about when you're doing your designs and looking at, at how you can improve that is taking those things into consideration. 
um, you know, how can we design more sensibly? How can we connect uh, and remove those leak paths? Um, how can we consolidate down in design? Um, again, this one you can see uh, just as an example. This was actually in Scotland and it's in a pit. So um, there's actually a little roof that goes on top of this and they wanted it all hidden. So they put the, you put the roof back on, you know, put a few leaves over the top and nobody knows it's there. And they could only do that because of the compact design um, of of the system um, on that. So that that helped the client. So again, it's looking at client, looking at solutions, looking at their problems and putting together the, you know, looking at the solutions for the problems. Um, again, level is often a problem. Again, you're often looking at multiple valves um, and multiple isolations. Again, if you can try and make this everything a little bit slimmer, Again, you've got an it's it's a little bit difficult to see, but you can see an old old style solution here where you'd have, you know, the, the connection from the the tank um, through a, an, a, the first isolation ball valve. Then you've got another T piece going off to the vent with a ball valve and then another ball valve going off to the transmitter. And then you duplicate that this sort of system would need would need a great amount of support physically and mechanically um, to ensure that you haven't got the strain on on these connections and on these on the valves. Whereas the alternative is to use, as I say, the monoflange again and have this um, and this would connect to that uh, differential pressure transmitter. So again, no fittings here. Um, and you'll have seen that being Parker Hannafin, and if you do know Parker Hannafin, we're always known for as an as a fittings um, a tubing supplier. And I think I've spent the whole 45 minutes up at the moment not talking about fittings or tubing or talking about getting rid of fittings and tubing, because what we're looking to again try and do is look at better solutions, you know, looking at how we can um improve and remove those leaks within the systems um another this is quite a new development but it's a, again something to think about um, a lot of co companies now are using um the close couple uh, uh, losing a, a system where you're using a um, capillary transmitter to try and get the transmitter um, face. This can be often in either very harsh environments or um, very uh, aggressive or corrosive environments. Or again, if you've got something where it, it could be like H2S or, or something like that. Um, you can look at how, how do you design this system together to again, you know, remove um, potential leak paths from there. And also, again, we're looking at lighter, faster insulations, compact, easy to install, easy to design. So, again, you could either use um, a conventional um, uh, a conventional flushing ring. Um, and the flushing ring has often two uses. So, obviously, the first and in its in its name is used to flush the face of the of the um, here and to clean it because obviously as soon as this becomes dirty then the uh, measurement becomes um, affected and again just to reiterate the whole point of doing this thing is to get an accurate measurement you know what we're trying to do is make sure that the measurement that is going to the control room or to the engineers is as accurate as possible. So obviously you're going to need to clean this. Um, so the first thing of a flushing ring is that you would be sending down either um, a either a slightly corrosive or slightly acidic material um, media in order to clean that fascia. So you can do that by you know pumping through and into and cleaning that through a flushing ring. Um, the flushing ring is also used um, to calibrate or can be used to calibrate. So you would isolate off the, the, the system, 
close the one side of the flushing spool and then add a known pressurized amount of uh, fluid into the system. You then can uh, calibrate the gauge without actually having to remove the gauge from the uh, process, which obviously again can be very important. It helps with downtime, so you're not having to do any physical removement, getting permits to do physical removement uh, of, of an isolation of. A, obviously, you isolate the system, but obviously you would have to get more permits to actually take things apart so you can actually calibrate the gauge in situ. Um, so that would be your flushing ring and then you put this, you know, on, onto a double block and bleed valve and then onto the process line. But what we also, what's also available in the market and, and from ourselves is one where the flushing part is actually an integral part of the double block and bleed valve. So you have the normal double block and bleed valve, the one end of the uh, flange is actually slightly thicker and we've actually integrated the flushing ring into that. So again, you're removing a further connection, um, a further potential leak point. So again, it's consolidating. Again, it's removing weight, um, etc. from there. And what we what we also do with this one, you, it's not on this, but it also can, you know, you can have these with integral studs. So you would, you know, put this with the integral studs on the base and on the top um, and literally slip it straight onto the process flange, bolt up straight. You know, you're not having to fiddle about with two hands with two lots of bolts. You can just put that straight on and you're bolting at one side. And then the same would be at the other side. Um, and again, we can put integral studs on the uh, conventional flushing ring. Again, trying to make that installation quicker and easier uh, for the engineers to do. Anything that's quicker and easier and less um, has less potential for error removes error. An error then removes, obviously, potential for leak. So the third thing, number seven, is good workmanship and training. Um, ensuring that your engineers um, have regular training. I mean, I, I always, I get, a, I always get phone calls saying your fittings leak. Not all the time, obviously, because we, but every time I say look at that it ends up not being the fitting that is leaking it's the poor workmanship fittings do not leak fittings who have been fittings that have been put together poorly leak so if you ensure that the en the engineers or the installation guys get regular training regular updates um understand what they're what they're utilizing um they're off tools around so this is a, a no-go gauge um, basically you once you've done your fitting you can actually see where the correct points are um, there's one and I'll show you in the picture if the fitting was correctly put together let me bring this a little closer I'm trying to work out how I can do this yes let's do it like this so if this fitting was correctly put together this wouldn't go round. A simple little tool here, but it wouldn't go in if that fitting was put together correctly. So making sure that your engineers have got all the correct tools to do the job is, is again key to ensuring that leakage is um, limited. Um, we also have um, now Everybody in the in Europe will go. We only know about twin ferrule fittings, whereas in the US, single ferrule fittings are the name of the game. And so we have a whole range of single ferrule fittings. Um, I'd I'd put it out to you to think about, and and um, you'll get a a um, a gold star from me. So 
give me an idea how many different ways a twin ferrule fitting solution could be put together? How many different ways a twin ferrule system could be put together incorrectly? Have a think about that and, and I'd like to see your answers. How many? So we've got the nut, the body, the back ferrule and the front ferrule. How many different ways do you think we could put this together incorrectly? OK. And I'll, we'll, we'll ans I'll answer that at the end. And then versus a single ferrule fitting. OK, versus a single ferrule fitting. Have a little think of that while I carry on. And obviously you can tell, you know, if you're looking at doing different systems, um, you will actually be able to obviously tell which is the single and which is the twin ferrule fitting because one has a black nut and the other one has a silver nut. So I'm keeping a very close eye. So as I say, the, the thing I've reiterated throughout this whole thing is, is ensuring correct design. You know, use the manufacturer's guidelines. We've all got tubing charts. Um, we keep an eye, you know, if you need any tubing charts, I'm more than happy to provide those to you. But they do give you a really good way of understanding what metals are available and what in what sizes, etc. Um, we often get specifications written and we see them and it asks for, let's say, um, uh, the tubing OD to be six and we're going to use the wall thickness of 1.5. Well, we don't do that. Um, you might physically be able to get that tube in the market, but it isn't, uh, you know, you won't be able to find a fitting that will work on that. And obviously, then you've got your the pressure ratings as well. So again, make sure that the size is correct, that you can actually utilize for the pressure rating that you're looking on your system. And we have those in Imperial and metric and in a whole different range. And then the third thing you will see in, on our on here is that we also color code them. So what you will have is for for the green si size sizes. Yeah, for the green. As I say, I'm more than happy to send people tubing charts and, and show them. But for the gr ones in green, you can do those by hand. For the ones in gray, we actually recommend a, a pre-assembly tool. And then for the ones in yellow, we'd recommend a high facet assembly tool, which is a pressurized system. Um, and this is to give you the right connection. Um, it's all to do with torque and actually, you know, you the whole point of tube and the, the fittings is to ensure that the front ferrule is uh, swaged and the back ferrule is locking that in place. If you um, pick the wrong, you know, if you don't pre-assemble, you're pr on, on those higher, pre you know, those higher wall thicknesses and higher sizes, the chances are you will get leaks. It, it Because it's just not designed, you know, you can't f manually do that with the basic one and a quarter turn situation that you would normally do. Um, you know, obviously don't mix manufacturers um, as, a, as a standard. Most manufacturers fittings don't fit with others. We've got slightly different ways of design, uh, designing. So standardization is perfect. Not mixing materials. Um, there's a, a whole thing about corrosion and mixing materials on corrosion that, that I could go through with you. Um, but also, you know, you're looking at ensuring that, again, that you're going to get the correct bite, that you're going to correct the, the correct swaging and, and locking of that system. And by mixing materials where they haven't been tested, you, you're, you're, again, asking for problems. Um, again, when you're looking at, at um, your, your manufacturer of choice, please ensure when you're specifying tubing that you specify the right hardness. That hardness for instrumentation tube and fittings is what we would recommend for use with our tube and fittings. 
other manufacturers might recommend different hardnesses. OK, and um, and then you'll also have the fact that you can actually find alternative hardnesses out in the market. If you pick the if you buy some tube that has the incorrect HRB, again, you are asking for um, problems. So you're either going to have a tube that's too soft and this, the it, the tube will start to compress and you'll get leaks or you'll have it too hard and it won't you know, swage and lock um, correctly. It, it, it might seem as though on the first pressure test it's OK, but over time, it, you know, particularly with something like vibration on the system, you will find that, you know, you these these things will start to move. Um, you've got to ensure that you've got the right pressures, the right and that you're doing the right, um, de, you know, designs. Um, this is um, a system called Intraflow and Modular Design. So again, modularization. If you can buy a system from um, a company all put together, you know, with uh, a filter, with gauges, with transmitters all fitted together and then pressure tested in factory rather than actually getting it put together on a site. Again, you've got a much uh, faster installation easier maintenance, it's less likely to have leakage because it's been tested and designed in the factory. Um, this system, um, if anybody's interested and works in the chemicals, in, tr um, in the analytical side of um, the industry, this is our interflow. So this is a whole um, system on a, I call it Meccano, it looks like Meccano, either Meccano or Lego, depending on your, your age and your uh, experience. But what you've got here is where you're looking at taking a very small sample from um, the, the process and you're sending it to a GC, mass spec, any sort of analytical um, uh, device then you only need minuscule samples. You know, you don't need litres of samples within a GC. Um, so this system is provides you with a ball valve, a filter, a pressure regulator, um, all in line, all in on a Meccano backplate. I mean, if I said this, this, this system um, was smaller than uh, an a, A5 piece of paper, that gives you an idea of the size of this system. And it's been, you know, we can have it with automation um, using the RMAX. This is an automated system that goes so you're, um, you can direct the sample to multiple different um, analyzers, etc. But it's all on a very small back plate. Um, and it's ideal, again, where you, rather than having a whole analyzer cabinet with huge numbers of valves and um, and filters and regulators etc you can put all that in a tiny cabinet on the side of a wall rather than having a whole uh, analytical um, house with with a huge um, uh, sample preparation area um, and obviously this means that your analyzer house which is um, has to be climate controlled etc um, can be kept, you know, isn't taking up as much space or size. I have one more slide. This is really good. I'm, I'm perfectly on time. So um, step 10, obviously to avoid leaks, use the correct CRAs, corrosion resistant alloys. Um, corrosion can lead to stress corrosion cracking. You can see here on this is actually a huge manifold block but the material used wasn't suitable for the application. So with salt, it, um, it caused stress corrosion cracking. Um, if you ever sort of see a system where out the back of your nut, you're seeing a lot of sort of corrosion, uh, rust looking, this usually means that either your back, you, or either your back ferrule or your front ferrule have started to corrode. 
And rather than it being the swaging and locking of the fitting that's doing the holding together of your pressurised system, it's probably rust that's holding it all together. So that's one thing for your engineers to keep an eye open for. Any rust being shown out at the back of a fitting, chances are, as I say, it's the ferrules that are that are starting to rust. Um, you know, we we are again. This this is a fitting um, that was incorrectly specified. So it was for a salt water service. Um, it was for a water deluge system, and the uh, customer, uh, the system builder, um, incorrectly put three one six fittings um, instead of six mo. So you can see the the tube is beautiful and clean and and no rust there. Um, but the fitting, which was 316, um, uh, if you sort of think of this being turned 90 degrees, you can see that this would have been where the residual water from the flushing of the um, water deluge system was. And this fitting, well, the system basically was tested on installation and then tested six months later. And um, as the engineer said, there was there was water spray going everywhere except where it needed to be. It was all coming out the fittings all over the pump system. So consequently, you know, make sure if you're subcontracting to, um, you know, a bit, so, something built to a subcontractor that they fully understand, you know, the materials that they're using and that they that they look at the right materials, um, you know, safety. I mean, as the engineer said in this instance, you know, had we had an issue, you know, a fire somewhere and we tried to deluge that that fire, um, we could have been in major trouble. I mean, it, it, it was put as a as a near miss, um, a, a quite a critical near miss uh, on that. So look at those. Look at, as I say, um, look at the CRA materials, what's around. Make sure you're picking the great, the correct grades you're picking, but in picking the correct materials, also think about the availability. Think about um, how easy it is to manipulate. Um, for example, something like super duplex, which is often used for corrosion resistant, was actually never designed for corrosion resistance. It was designed for its strength and is an absolute pain to bend. If you've ever tried to install super duplex tubing, particularly if you're going for slightly larger thicknesses of wall and, and larger sizes, you can't, you have to have it mechanically bent. You can't actually do that by hand with a with a little tube bender. So again, you know, uh, engineers should be looking at making sure they're making the right choices. They're understanding what standards they're putting in the specifications, what standards they're asking people to comply with. Um, you know, if you want NACE, do you actually really need NACE or are you just is that just a, a buzzword that you're putting in? You know, make sure you're you're understanding what you're actually looking for um, and, and choose the right materials. Um, you know, if if you're looking at a system and you're saying, well, I'd like to save money. So what I'll do, I'll put a cost effect, you know, expensive tubing in there, but cheap fittings. You might as well just put the whole system as six it's as you know three one six because at least then it'll all degrade at the same rate and that is it thank you very much everybody thank you for listening on such a hot evening thanks deborah that's great so we've got a couple of uh, guesses um, i threw one in there but john guessed five incorrect ways for the double ferrule uh stuart guessed 10 i put six we've got Keith. a Keith's saying seven. 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 Yeah. Seven on the video. Yeah. So go on, put us out of our misery, Deborah. Are you going to do that when you do your QA? No, I can do that now. So there's actually 13 different ways to put this together, only one of which is correct. Gosh. Yeah. So just to give whoops. Just to give you um just to give you some examples, you can leave the leave the back ferrule out. You can put two in. You can put the back ferrule in the wrong way around. So instead of being this way, it's putting the other way. And the same occurs with the front ferrule. You can leave it out. You can put two in. 
You can place it the other way around. Um, you can have the front ferrule at the back and the back ferrule at the front. Uh, you can, I mean, as I say, 13 different ways to put it together incorrectly. Uh, 12 ways to put it together incorrectly and one way to put it in correctly. And I tell you what, I've we've seen them all. We've seen every 13. Particularly, we see the back ferrule missing. Oh, your fitting's leaking. Oh, have a look at it. Take it apart. Oh, there's no back ferrule to it. Probably because, you know, particularly on a smaller system, someone's putting it together and they drop the back ferrule out and it and it goes through the grating and all of a sudden they go, well, I can't be bothered to go and get another fitting. I'll just put it together. It's, it's not, it's on it. It's only a little bit of material. It's not really that important. So, yeah. So, 13 different ways on the twin ferrule. On the single ferrule, you can leave it out or you can have it the wrong way around. So you've got three. And that's why we sort of promote the single ferrule fitting. It, it's a little bit sort of, um, I say, not, not so well known in the UK, but in the US is used a lot. But it, we're trying to promote it because in the, you know, in Europe, basically, because it's, you know, you, you've, you're you either you, with three ways of getting it wrong it or three ways, two ways of getting it wrong and one way of getting it right. It's much more easier to not have an error. So that's me. <laughs>